That's right, on March 12, 1989, the web was designed. There was a time before Google, we yep. all remember it. One danger is this could turn out to be an Alita system, one available only to people with a computer and a modem. Imagine this. Take away the entire concept of the World Wide Web. No websites, no social media, no Google. There is no directory. There are no signs, nothing to guide you. There's nothing but a text prompt. So what do you do? Where do you go? There he is. And if we do a directory, we'll see it has a whole bunch of stuff, the U.S. budget. The internet in the late 80s through the early 90s was a revelation for those new to it. But aside from the struggle of actually getting online, the next problem people encountered was simply navigating their way around. This was definitive of the internet experience and had been characterized as an exponentially growing mass of poorly classified data. And it was rapidly growing. In 1984, the internet had about a thousand hosts in total. And in 1987, this had increased to 10,000. But by 1990, the number of hosts stood at more than 100,000. This growth began to expose a weakness of the internet in this era, a weakness that would come to be defined as the resource discovery problem. When a new resource like an FTP site was connected to the internet, there was no real way for users to discover it on their own. And this posed a serious problem for many users. A large part of experiencing the internet at this time was simply knowing which FTP sites hosted the files you needed or what systems you could tell it into to access a service. And this was often found out by word of mouth. Ed Kroll in The Whole Internet said this even amounted to a quote, good old boys network, with some experienced users gatekeeping the best places to find resources like software. And at this time, the internet was still primarily used by researchers and academics, with very little commercial traffic. Universities were, uh, most, especially the bigger universities, were, were all, basically all on the net. Uh, and there were um, corporate research labs that were on the net. And then most other corporations were not. That's Mike Schwartz. He was one of the first to really recognize and investigate the emerging resource discovery problem. Because I remember when I was in grad school, as I was finishing my thesis, people were starting to talk about it and some of the, re the grant proposals that they were working on, no one was really working on it yet. And so I started focusing on that. And I think my work was really popularized the term. Schwartz recognized that solving this problem was the key to unlocking the potential of the net. The idea of being able to search through all this stuff, you know, in one place across administratively decentralized, you know, organizations, which is, that's really pretty different from like at the time, you know, like a, a car catalog at a library, there were online, you know, there were computer systems you could search the library books, but you're basically searching the library books at that library or maybe a group of libraries that had banded together, but it wasn't like, you know, you're searching all the resources at different companies and universities and all different people who had basically no uh, administrative relationship all put up. That was pretty different and new and interesting. And also at the time, I guess the other thing I would say that made it pretty interesting is that was when all the bulletin boards and, you know, like Usenet was really uh, getting pretty big at that point. And that was also quite different from like what were the communities you had available to you, the people you worked around or people you knew, you know, that you were in physical proximity to. And all of a sudden now there was this way you could reach out to people with common interests all over the world. That was exciting, different. Schwartz started the Networked Resource Discovery Project in 1988 while at the University of Colorado in Boulder. The idea was to investigate a number of different techniques on how decentralized systems of resources like the internet could be searched. And I remember trying different things. I mean, some of what I did was trying searching other resources since obviously the web wasn't there yet. So, you know, like I had one project that was trying to search for computers in the local network, you know, and try to build maps of that. And then another one for searching for people on the, on the, out on the internet. And then another thing I tried was I tried to convince my university at the time to let me put their uh, information about people, the different faculty and staff up online so it could be searched. And I remember I went through this formal process at the end, they said no. 
which, you know, now seems ridiculous. I was just interested in like, you know, I don't know that I thought that was going to be some groundbreaking development, but let's try it. Like, obviously down the road, things going to be online. Let's try to start moving that direction. Schwartz's research and experiments were pivotal in illuminating the fundamental challenges of resource discovery. And there were other ongoing efforts like the X.500 standard that sought to impose a more rigid structure to resource discovery. But the core problem still remained because you had thousands of hosts already scattered across the internet hosting hundreds of gigabytes of data with millions of users and all of which was organized in its own unique way. And so it was that sandbox nature of the internet that came with a seemingly insurmountable challenge. How do you index all of that so people can actually find it? Hailing from the small Caribbean nation of Barbados, Alan Imtaj was enrolled in his third year in the computer science undergraduate program at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. The year was 1986, and the college was just then getting its first connection to the internet. McGill, um, from what we can tell, had the second internet link into Canada. The first being University of British Columbia, UBC. Uh, I think that was two weeks before McGill. We had a VAX machine, which was connected to a modem running at 9600 baud. Uh, and it connected to Boston. After finishing his undergraduate degree, Imtaj then continued at McGill as a graduate student and was working in system administration for the School of Computer Science. He became the go-to guy for finding software on the internet, which he found on anonymous FTP servers. FTP, or File Transfer Protocol, actually had its start all the way back in 1971, prior to even the invention of Ethernet. The protocol was developed by Abe Bouchon and his colleagues at MIT's Project MAC, the project on mathematics and computation. The goal back then was to develop a protocol for systems on the ARPANET to exchange files, but it wouldn't be until 1985 that it would eventually evolve into the protocol familiar to us today. Through the early 90s, FTP was a dominant service, accounting for just over 50% of the data traversing the NSFNet backbone in the United States. This was due in part to so-called anonymous FTP servers. These were FTP sites typically hosted by universities that allowed anyone on the internet to log in and access their contents. They would often contain archives of everything from software, literature, scientific research, and everything in between. And it was all freely available. They were a critical resource for users on the net at the time. But because there was no way to search for FTP sites, when you wanted to find information on a topic or maybe a specific software program, you had to rely on hand curated directories like these, or like we described earlier, just by word of mouth. This was a central problem for users on the internet. And even though Imtaj knew of many different FTP sites, it was still time consuming to connect to each one, list out the directory contents and find the file he was looking for. And this is exactly what the resource discovery problem was, because you had all of these anonymous FTP sites scattered around the globe, and each had their own unique collection of software. And the contents could be changed regularly, so programs could be added or removed, directories could be created or changed, and even for advanced users, it quickly became an impossible task to keep track of it all. So Imtaj wrote a basic shell script to fetch the directory listings of FTP sites that he frequented using the command ls space dash lr. The l option specified a long format showing the file permissions, file size, and so on. And the r option specified a recursive listing, listing the contents of all subdirectories. He ran the script overnight as that ended up being faster as the site usage was much lower during the evening hours. The following day, he could then parse through the directory and file listings at his leisure, searching for the files he needed without needing to manually connect to each FTP site. This caught the attention of a manager also in the system administration group, Peter Deutsch. They then enlisted the help of their colleague, Bill Helan, to give the script a simple interface so that others could use it elsewhere on the internet. But first, they needed a name. 
They decided on the play of the word archive by removing the V to make Archie. And at first, it was a very simple process. Basically, all we did was issue a recursive directory listing uh, of, of, of that directory. And then we'd pull that back and ultimately with a database and all that kind of stuff. But initially, it was just one big file for that host. In the Archie script and interface, we're running on a Sun 4280 owned by the university. We hijacked it. We didn't tell anybody what we were doing with it. And we just hijacked it. Well, we were assisted men, so we, we had access to it. We, we allocated it. With the hardware secured and the software given an interface, a Usenet post by Deutsch on September 10th of 1990 was one of the first announcements of Archie to the public. Users could telnet into the Sun server at quiche.cs.mcgill.ca, log in as Archie, and query the latest FTP file listings using the prog command, which would launch a grep command with the specified search stream. The return results would show any matching file names from Archie's database, along with their directory location on the host where the files could be found. And as word spread about Archie over the next few months, the telnet traffic to the server skyrocketed and ended up accounting for half of the internet traffic in Eastern Canada. What started out as a simple shell script turned out to be the world's first search engine. Archie had been around for a while, several months, uh, and our school of computer science, the director, who was a very proper buttoned up Italian gentleman, went to a conference or some meeting of his peers and people, somebody came over and shook his hand and said, oh my God, you know, thank you, thank you for providing Archie. It's, it's an amazing resource. And he had no idea what I was talking about, but, you know, being the diplomat, he, he sort of nodded and said, oh, you're more than welcome. And, you know, uh, glad to be of service. And then came back to us, called, hauled us upstairs and said, what the hell are you guys doing out there? You know? That makes me very angry. After graduating from McGill, Imtaj and Deutsch attended their first IETF meeting in Santa Fe in 1991, and they immediately found themselves plunged into the exciting world of internet standards. You know, you would go to the IETF and hang out with Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn and, you know, all of these foundational pioneers of the internet. Um, they were just there, you know, and then, you know, then the, the user layer came in, so Tim Berners-Lee uh, was in on that, and uh, Brewster Kale for Waze, and Mark McKay Hill for Gopher. And so it was kind of a logical thing that because we were operating at that level, that somehow we should be involved in the ITF. Not, not so much to standardize Archie as such, but because this was the up-and-coming uh, area of uh, of the internet and we wanted to be a part of it and they wanted us to be a part of it. And it was around this time that Intaj and Deutsch decided to commercialize Archie by creating Bunyip Information Systems. They would sell software licenses to Archie primarily to other universities and organizations that had an interest in running an Archie server. Bunyip was, as far as we know, the first company in the world that was specifically created for uh, internet information services, as opposed to just providing networking access, for example. I mean, there were companies that were providing internet services, but not, not at that layer, you know, not at that level. And despite commercializing their product, they did not patent the technology. Vint Surf uh, said to us one night, I believe in a bar, you know, have you guys thought about patents in there? And he said it as kind of a joke because remember there was a pretty good period of time there where commercial activity wasn't allowed on the internet, which sound, kind of sounds weird to say that now, but when it was the NSF net, when the NSF was paying for it, uh, commercial activity wasn't allowed. We honestly did think about patenting the, you know, the, the, pro the process. Uh, decided not to do it because we figured, again, in this whole environment of uh, we're all in this together, we're all trying to make the world a better place, we're all trying to, you know, move the ball down the field and, and get this thing up and get this baby up and running, that it was going to have a chilling effect on the, uh, nobody else had done it, there was no other patented, patented 
stuff like that out there. And through the mid 90s, Archie exploded in popularity. It was one of the core internet services users needed to know, along with other early search engines like Veronica and Waze. And at its height in 1996, Archie servers were indexing thousands of FTP sites, collectively containing over 5.7 million files, representing hundreds of gigabytes of data. There were 60 Archie servers located in over 20 countries around the globe, separated out into four regions. Archie was everywhere, and it was so critical to daily internet life that it was found in pretty much any internet book from that time period, and even featured in training videos for new internet users. But in the background, the World Wide Web was quickly gaining popularity. The web's Hypertext Transport Protocol, or HTTP, supported file transfer, enabling even easier file downloads compared to FTP. And the concept of hyperlinks made resource discovery that much easier. But even the people there at the time were surprised at how quickly it took off. The Internet Engineering Task Force meeting, I think it was in 1990, when Tim Berners-Lee got up and made a presentation about the web. You know, so it was this new thing and I remember I was standing in the back talking to some of my buddies going like, we've got Archie and Gopher and Waze and whatever else. Like, what do we need this thing for? I'm like, I just think like I did not understand as I think a bunch of my colleagues also didn't really appreciate the monumental change that it was to have this graphical user interface. As the World Wide Web became the predominant information platform, Archie servers began shutting down. Imtaj had already left Bunyip by 1996, and the company itself persisted until 1999 before closing down for good, effectively ending all support for any remaining Archie servers. I just burnt out, you know, it was just, I was traveling 150,000 miles a year, and li li living out of a suitcase, and it was, it was hard to do it in Quebec at the time. It wasn't really a, a center of, of technology development. So, you know, the money was all in Silicon Valley, things that were much better funded and it had much, much more access to, to talent. And, you know, so it just, it was in the wrong place at the wrong time to sort of keep growing. And so, yeah, ultimately the sort of world passed it by, so. By this time in 1999, the giants of World Wide Web search like AltaVista, Lycos and Yahoo had been operating for years. The world had moved on, and Archie, the pioneering project from a university student, had all but vanished from the internet. And today, it has completely disappeared. That got us thinking, why don't we try to resurrect an Archie server? I mean, what better way to honor this world-changing technology, not to mention FTP's now 50-year legacy, than to use Archie to index anonymous FTP servers that are still out there on the internet. But first, we need a copy of Archie. And little did we know, but we were about to embark on a months-long journey. There was one client that I was forbidden by, we were forbidden by law to actually talk about. That re, re, I, I suspect 30 years later, they don't really care, but there there was, there was let's just put it this way, the, the in, some of the intelligence services, let's just put it that way. 